So, I kind of love Mega Man games. I've talked about titles from this series on this very channel before, ranging from Wondersworn weirdness, to ROM hacks, to even covering how Mega Man X6 is a terrible game I love, due in part to its many, many faults. Hell, if it weren't for talking about Mega Man 5 on Nest with some rando about five years back, I would have never started hanging out with the wonderful guy who's now my fiance. My Mega Man obsession dates back over a decade though. When Mega Man 9 hit WiiWare back in 2008, I remember the community over on Screw Attack, remember that place, going wild over it. And being the avid Screw Attack viewer I was, I just had to give it a shot. And it kicked my ass. Hard. But I was oddly hooked, and I just kept coming back for more, and didn't stop until, after several weeks, I finally laid the smack down on Dr. Wily and beat the game, and then thanks to having a few hundred Wii points left, I downloaded and tried Mega Man 2 as well. A few months later, I then had one of my first ever experiences going to a garage sale. Imagine my surprise where I found six different Mega Man games, all for a few bucks each. These were Mega Man Extreme 1 and 2 for Game Boy Color, along with copies of classic Mega Man 1 through 4 on the original Game Boy. A complete set of Mega Man Game Boy goodness, excluding the rare and elusive Mega Man 5, which I would import from Japan some years later, so I wouldn't have to sell a kidney to afford an American version. And these games clearly left an impact on me. When I first started Stuff We Play back in 2016, literally one of the first videos I made was a look back on these Mega Man Game Boy games. All seven official titles, plus a weird bootleg game I threw in for some reason because, I don't know, it was 2016. So to celebrate five years of doing this YouTube thing, let's see how my thoughts have changed on these titles. We're going to be looking at Mega Man 1 through 5 on the Game Boy, the two Mega Man Extreme games, and instead of that weird bootleg title, we'll be ending off by looking at the strange Mega Man Game Gear game. Because damn, when will I ever get a chance to look at that thing again? This is Retrospective, the series where I take a look back at the games from my childhood to see how they stack up today. And it's also the start of Mega May, where for the next four weeks, I'll be taking a look at a whole slew of weird and retro Mega Man goodness. Today's vid, the Weird Mega Man Game Boy Games. These are the eight games we'll be looking at today. Well, seven of them anyways. That Game Gear game is bank account drainingly expensive, so just kind of imagine that I have a physical cartridge of it here. Also, I won't be covering any of the Mega Man Battle Network or Zero games of the Game Boy Advance. I honestly feel like covering eight games in one vid is enough. I can already tell that this one is going to be a long one. I guess you could say that for today's video, a quickie would just not cut it. These games, though all kind of unique in their own right, have many similar quirks. All of them except Game Boy Mega Man 5 mix and match bosses from different mainline Mega Man games and give them stages that are similar in style to their home console counterparts but have enough differences for the most part to not feel completely like a bunch of lazy rehashes. Most of these games had way cooler names in Japan too. GB Mega Man's 1 through 5 were titled Rockman World 1 through 5 in Japan, while the two Mega Man Extreme games are called Rockman X Cyber Mission 1 and 2. And that that just sounds so cool. As for that Mega Man Game Gear game though, well, that one was developed by US Gold, a British developer, and then exclusively released in North America. So of course that one doesn't even have a Japanese name. All of the five classic Game Boy Mega Man games were also not developed by Capcom. Rockman Worlds 1, 3, 4, and 5 were all handled by Minakuchi Engineering, the same group that would later create Mega Man The Wily Wars on the Sega Genesis and Mega Man X3 for the Super Nintendo, PlayStation 1, and Sega Saturn. And I know those two games are rather polarizing, but hey, I think they're pretty fun, so there's that. Mega Man 2 on Game Boy, however, was outsourced to a completely different company altogether, with that being Japan's System House. The extreme games, though, were just outright handled by Capcom themselves. The main thing that all of these games have in common 
is that most Mega Man fans just write them off as being rehashes of the NES and SNES games that really bring nothing new to the table. But is that really the case here? Are most of these games really nothing more than run-of-the-mill rehashes with nothing new on offer? Or are they actually a bit more than that? Eh! <laughs> The first Mega Man game came out on the NES back in 1987. The first Game Boy Mega Man game, though, wouldn't hit store shelves until 1991, the same year as Mega Man 4 on NES. Despite being referred to as just Rockman World in Japan, in the West, this game was called Mega Man Dr. Wily's Revenge, a title that seems to imply a grand new adventure with new traps and tribulations. And that's... right ish? I mean, the game itself is mostly a mashup of elements from Mega Man 1 and 2 on NES, which I guess is kind of a new and weird experience in its own kind of odd way. The plot here is pretty simple. Dr. Wily is evil, but also facing budget cuts. So instead of making eight new robot masters for Mega Man to fight, he just brings back four from Mega Man 1 on NES. Those are respectively Cutman, Electman, Iceman, Fireman, because no one cares about Bombman and Gutsman, I guess. While the main four stages all share tropes with their NES counterparts, there are some new gimmicks here too. Cutman's stage, for example, has these spinning scissor enemies that you literally cannot defeat, along with these conveyor belts that seem straight out of Metal Man stage and Mega Man 2. Fireman stage has these big water heater looking guys from Heat Man and Quick Man stages, while Lechman has these shooty Son Goku guys from Air Man stage. Finally, as for Iceman, there are these icicle platforms you have to navigate around that actually lead to some pretty intense platforming sections. The soundtrack here mostly consists of faithful recreation of the NES music, though the few original tunes here are all a blast to listen to. All the music here also has that kind of early Game Boy sound. Like, it seems a bit tinny and less full compared to a lot of the soundtracks in later Game Boy games, but in a way that's a result of the compositions themselves and not any hardware issues. It sounds like something that's a knock against it, but it's weirdly charming in a way. I get a similar vibe from the music in games like Super Mario Land and Solar Striker. The latter, by the way, which was also developed by Minakuchi Engineering. Anyways, after defeating the four returning robot masters and stealing their weapons for your own use, just like in most other Mega Man games, you're already off to Dr. Wily's Fortress after only like, what, 15 minutes if you don't die a ton? The first stage here is a pretty tough gauntlet. It's filled to the brim with traps and obstacles, and that's not to mention the boss rush at the end. But then again, I guess it could be expected for this stage to be rather difficult, as, you know, this is the final fortress. Then again, while Mega Man games are known for being difficult, damn it, Dr. Wily's Revenge is one of the toughest out there. There's only six stages in the entire game, so to make sure your experience here lasts, the devs made sure to give each stage the grace and softness of a swift kick to the balls. I say this as someone who has actually beaten Dr. Wily's Revenge a few times, by the way. But again, I've had this game since I was a kid. This is definitely not a game for the faint of heart or newcomers to the series. And short as it is, it does have a couple of surprises up its sleeve at the end of that first fortress stage. When you reach the boss rush at the end of Wily Stage 1, you'll find four teleporting hatches, which, if experiences from previous Mega Man games are to go by, should lead to rematches against the four bosses you beat in the previous stages. But that is not the case here. Instead, here comes four bosses from Mega Man 2, complete with their own weakness chain and weapons for you to obtain. These are Quick Man, Bubble Man, Flash Man, and Heat Man. And I am so glad they're just boss fights here, because I would not like to see what the folks at Minakuchi would do with Quick Man's lasers. Perhaps mercifully, these fights aren't too bad. Being a boss rush and all, your health gets restored after each fight, but then, once they are done, you have to fight a completely new boss. This is Anchor. Anchor is the first of a class of robots featured in the Game Boy Mega Man games called the Mega Man Killers. The role in the series is kind of self-explanatory from that name, but the battle against Anchor himself is admittedly kind of easy. 
How dang anticlimactic. The fight goes like this. You shoot at him, he absorbs your shots while still taking damage, then shoots a blast back at you. Then he runs across the room, rinse and repeat. Easy fight, but please try your damnedest not to get a game over here. If you do, it's back all the way to the start of the fortress, and that ain't fun. But once Anchor is defeated, you take his mirror buster weapon and head on to the final stage of the game, which you must traverse through to fight Dr. Wily himself. And this stage is brutal. A bit cheap at times too. There's some instant death traps here that you likely wouldn't be able to see coming on your first time through. I way prefer how these two stages were handled when they were mushed together as part of the Mega Man 10 DLC years later. There's even a fight with the Anchor there too. It's good stuff, and honestly I may even recommend that over playing Dr. Wily's Revenge itself. To be fair, you can avoid some of the disappearing block puzzles and spike traps here using the carry ability. This is a weapon quote unquote that just generates a temporary platform for you to use, but if you want to beat Dr. Wily's Revenge, then you're going to have to employ a fine mix of quick reflexes and endurance or trial and error based stage design to lay the smack down on Dr. Wily. Or rather, to reach that final fight with Dr. Wily. Yeah, that final boss fight actually isn't even that bad. Challenging? Sure. But honestly, it's not as bad as the stage leading up to him. Dr. Wily has multiple forms and, like with Anchor, please avoid dying here if you can. Probably doesn't help that this game doesn't have any E-Tanks though, since a health restore would really come in handy here. And if you do get a game over against Dr. Wily, do not accidentally choose to go back to the stage select. Going through the second Wily stage is brutal enough, but returning to the stage select would force you to go through the whole fortress again. All in all, Dr. Wily's Revenge is not a bad game, but it's certainly a difficult one. It's pretty solid overall, though I'd argue several of the later Game Boy games are just much better, though also a few are definitely worse too. Dr. Wily's Revenge is a perfectly middle of the road Mega Man game that can offer a good challenge to longtime fans, but that everyone else can be pretty comfortable giving a pass. It's a pretty decent start to the Mega Man series on Nintendo's black and white brick. And with luck, things will only be up from here. Right? Hopefully? Please? Oy vey. <laughs> Back over on the NES, the jump from Mega Man 1 to Mega Man 2 was pretty huge. And that's saying something since Mega Man 1 itself was a pretty fun little game. Though not one of my favorite classic Mega Man titles though, Mega Man 2 on NES was an incredibly fun and polished experience, and it's really easy to see why it became the game that would define the series. If you're talking to someone and they're like, oh yeah, I grew up playing Mega Man, most of the time, if they're not remembering playing the old school Mega Man X games, they're remembering playing Mega Man 2. Perhaps more influential than the game itself was the soundtrack. If you were to type Mega Man Remix into that YouTube search bar up there, I can assure you that probably around half the results are just going to be Mega Man 2 mixes. And of those, half of those would be of the Dr. Wily Stage 1 theme specifically. What I'm getting at is that Mega Man 2 on NES is a pretty dang good game. There's a reason why it's so fondly remembered by so many people. And I need to stress that because Mega Man 2 on Game Boy ain't so good. Let me just get that soundtrack out of the way to start. The compositions themselves aren't awful, but somehow when the tunes were put on the Game Boy, the pitches got all wonky. It's legitimately ear grating and headache inducing to listen to for more than a few seconds. If Mega Man 2 on NES is best played hooked up to a home theater surround sound system, then Mega Man 2 on Game Boy is best played on mute. Maybe even with some earplugs in for good measure. On that musical note, instead of playing the GB Mega Man 2 soundtrack for the rest of this section, I will instead be using the Mega Man 2 GB Remade soundtrack from Rush Jet 1. Seriously, that album really shows the potential this soundtrack had to be, well, good. And you should absolutely give it a listen if you get the chance. Now, let me stress that word there. Potential. I think that's a running theme with this game. MM2GB really does have a lot of potential to be something great and unique. 
but it doesn't really live up to that potential. Oddly enough, it's also the only one of the five classic Game Boy Mega Man games to not feature a Mega Man killer. This game instead focuses on Dr. Wily building a time machine, going to the future, kidnapping and reprogramming the future version of Mega Man to be evil, giving him a dumb looking green helmet and a pogo stick, and then heading back to the past to make the two Mega Man fight each other to the death. It sounds like a pretty cool concept, and a character who looks exactly like this reprogrammed future Mega Man, named Quint, would later appear in Mega Man Base 2 on the Wonderswan. Though the fan base is divided on whether or not that character, referred to as Mega Man Shadow in that game, is actually the same character or not. In my personal headcanon, they are absolutely the same character, but that's not a discussion for here. If you want my thoughts on that game, I did a video on it last year, link in the iCard above. At the very least, the Quint plot sounds pretty unique. That time travel element also leads some pretty cool looking stage theming. MM2GB is at the very least pretty decently looking, even if a lot of the bosses feel strangely small. But dang, that Dolly-esque theming in that final Dr. Wily stage is just such a unique aesthetic for a Mega Man level, I, I really like it. There is so much potential here, and I really like a lot of the ideas I'm seeing here. Yet, the whole experience just feels kind of like a rehash of Dr. Wily's Revenge, with stage themes and bosses being rehashed more so from Mega Man 2 and 3, with not much of Mega Man 1 to be seen here. Released stateside in 1992, Mega Man 2 and Game Boy has some pretty solid stage design parts. The Mega Man 2 portion of the game features Metal Man, Air Man, Wood Man, and... Clash Man? No, 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 he's not Crash Man, see? Clash Man. Original character, do not steal. Then, once you reach Dr. Wily's Fortress, you have to fight four Robot Masters from Mega Man 3 before you can take on Quint. These are Needle Man, Magnet Man, Hard Man, huh, and Top Man. What's a nice change of pace, however, is that these bosses have actual stages. Instead of choosing these stages through a traditional stage select screen though, you access them through teleporters like you would in a traditional Mega Man Boss Rush stage. That's actually pretty cool because, like, if you were playing this game back in the day directly after playing Mega Man Dr. Wily's Revenge, then it'd lead to a bit of a subversion of expectations because you would be going through actual stages instead of just another lackluster boss rush, which I do appreciate. But, unlike in the Minakuchi Mega Man games, MM2GB stages feel a lot more similar to their NES counterparts. If I had to describe the stages here with one word, it'd be safe. The folks at Japan's System House didn't seem to want to add an original gimmicks or stage hazards to stages, or at the very least the extent that Minakuchi did, and indeed that goes for wanting to bring in elements from other games as well. I mean sure, the actual stage layouts are different than in the NES games, but the vibe you get from these stages is pretty much identical to their NES counterparts, but a little slower and in black and white. Also, Mega Man's canine buddy Rush is here and he works exactly as he did in Mega Man 3 on NES. This means that you can just outright bypass a lot of the platforming obstacles. Oh, and E-Tanks are here now too, meaning that you can just brute force your way through the final bosses if you want. Look, credit where credit is due. Most of the stage design isn't bad, it really isn't. But all of it, save that really wacky looking final Dr. Wily stage, just feels bland to me. Airman stage, for example, may have a different layout than on the NES, but certainly feels samey enough when put side by side with the original. Also, you know how I think that Dr. Wily's Revenge can often be too difficult for its own good? Well, Mega Man 2 on Game Boy has the opposite problem. It's just piss easy. Mega Man 2 GB is definitely not the worst Mega Man game ever. Well, gameplay wise anyways. But despite most of the other Game Boy games being rather rehashing in ways, this is the only one of the classic games that feels like it lacks an identity of its own. I mean, dang, it definitely has one of the most undercooked time travel plots I've ever seen. Why is Quint future Mega Man? What does this add to the story? I'm so confused. Why did... Wh why? There are just so many better ways they could have utilized this plot than the way they did. Like, what if they'd use it as an excuse to make an original Mega Man game featuring stages based off significant times and places in history? And like, that's just one of many, many different ways they could have tackled this type of story instead of how they did. 
And I'm not asking for a deep story either. This is a platformer on the Game Boy. I just want something that feels like it has more soul, I guess? All we got was a mediocre, half-baked, black and white version of half of Mega Man 2, half of Mega Man 3, and like a Salvador Dali painting with the worst soundtrack in the entire series. And just, there's so, so, so much missed potential. But at the very least, things are only up from here, right? Okay, so Mega Man 3 on Game Boy is, in many ways, a return to form for the series. Minakuchi was back at the helm here, where they would remain for the rest of the classic GB games. Released mere months after Mega Man 2 on Game Boy, this one is absolutely an upgrade in regards to sound design and overall flow. Instead of late game teleporter shenanigans, this title adopts an approach of having you fight four robot masters of Mega Man 3, going through a mid-game fortress stage, then fighting four robot masters from Mega Man 4 before going on to the final Dr. Wily Fortress. By the way, the bosses here are Snake Man, Gemini Man, Shadow Man, and Spark Man for the Mega Man 3 section, with Dust Man, Skull Man, Dive Man, and Drill Man coming in for the Mega Man 4 section. E-Tanks and Rush are back too, though Rush's Rush Jet ability now works like it did in Mega Man 4 and onwards instead of like it did in Mega Man 3 in the previous game. Meaning, you can't just fly absolutely anywhere, and oh, look at that! Platforming challenges now potentially pose a threat again. The Mega Man 4 portion of the game also has a proper boss select, though this is at the cost of this being one of the only games in the series to not have any sort of boss rush at all. Honestly, I don't have any problem with that. The next of the Mega Man killers is here too, and he's ready to take you on. This is the punkish, uh, punk. I seriously love this guy's design, and though his boss pattern is rather repetitive, he packs enough of a punch that it makes him a decent challenge. Also, his weapon, the Screw Crusher, travels in an arc, which makes it rather situational sure, but also super effective when it's usable. Now, I know this all sounds really positive. It probably seems like I love this title and always have, but in reality, I hated this one as a kid. When I first looked at this one back in 2016 too, I still seem to really hate it. But when I first booted up for this video, I actually had a lot of fun, at first anyways. The Mega Man 3 portion is tough, but not overbearingly so. The stage design is just rock solid. Snake Man stage even has those massive snake mini bosses from the NES game, which are kind of impressive to see here on the Game Boy. I was surprised. I even started thinking, dang, maybe I was just an idiot as a teenager. This isn't so bad at all. And don't get me wrong, I was an idiot as a teenager, but not because of my hatred for this game. In the Mega Man 4 section of Mega Man 3 GB, the difficulty starts to go all over the place. Dive Man and Skull Man aren't too bad, but Drill Man stage has some sections that just feel like pure BS. There are traps that are a pain to avoid and all, but ugh, dang, it just doesn't hold a candle to Dustman's stage. That one was so bad that I had to write down my password, because you see, none of these games have any save systems built in, and then shut off the game. Twice! What a ridiculous, terrible stage filled with pixel-perfect jumps and one-hit kill traps. To boot, a lot of these problems rear their ugly heads again in Dr. Wily's Fortress, which for some reason is based on an oil platform here. Oh damn, I forgot to mention the plot. Apparently Dr. Wily has set up this base out at sea so he could try to brainwash a bunch of robots to do his bidding. Thankfully, thanks to Mega Man, that doesn't end up going as planned. Mega Man 3 on Game Boy actually isn't a bad game for like 85% of it. I really enjoyed going back and playing most of this one, and I'm legitimately happy that, for the most part, my opinion has changed on it. But those few stages that are bad are just really, really bad, and they break the pacing just in half. They're dreadful, and I don't think it's fair to say, oh yeah, the game is great and you should absolutely play it, as long as you skip a few of the stages and shut it off before the end. It may have more identity and polish than the MM2 GB, and I definitely prefer it over that one, but it's still just not a great experience on the whole. 
That said, if you ever find a cartridge on the cheap and you're a diehard Mega Man fan, well, there's certainly worse ways you could spend a few bucks. Even then, you may still be better off giving this one a pass and saving your money though. Mega Man 4 on Game Boy would not only fix most of my problems with this one, but also end up as one of my all-time favorite games in the entire series. <laughs> I've got to stress something. Favorite doesn't necessarily mean best, critically speaking. As we'll see on several levels, Mega Man 5 on Game Boy is just a better game than Mega Man 4. But also, I didn't own Game Boy Mega Man 5 as a kid. As far as I knew, this was the pinnacle of handheld black and white Mega Man games, and also the last of them. But dang it, it's such a great adventure. Of all the Game Boy titles, this is the one I sunk the most time into, playing it time and time again. Sure, it also has its rehashy elements. This time you're pitted up against Bright Man, Toad Man, Pharaoh Man, and Ring Man from Mega Man 4, and then you go through a sort of short interlude fortress before going up against Stone Man, Charge Man, Napalm Man, and Crystal Man from Mega Man 5. Released in 1993, this was the fourth time in three years that Mega Man fans got to see this formula play out on the Game Boy. Perhaps a lot of folks were just getting sick of it, as Mega Man 5 would ditch this formula. But dang, of all the games that does that rehashy boss song and dance thing, Mega Man 4 on Game Boy offers such unique stage layouts and gimmicks that it all makes these stages worth playing through even if you played their NES counterparts to death. The difficulty here, too, is easily the fairest of all the classic Game Boy games. It's difficult, sure, but I can't think of any gotcha moments, even from when I was a kid. I mean, I guess Toad Man is just as much of a joke here as he was in the NES games. <laughs> Look at him, he's, he's just hopping around. On a more serious note, though, it is possible to kind of trap yourself in one of the exploding missile segments in one of the late stages, so just be mindful of that. Oh yeah! This is our Mega Man killer this time around. Ballad. You know, kind of like the term ballad, because Capcom had a thing for musical references. His weapon is his omnidirectional exploding ball, the Ballad Cracker, and it's actually pretty useful. Oh, and he also gets some sick shades at one point. What a badass. Mega Man 4 GB also does some things mechanically that really sets it apart from every game in the series up to this point, too. For example, take a look at Dr. Light's shop here. Er, I mean Dr. Wright's shop. I swear, this is the only major typo I noticed while playing through again. But yeah, throughout Mega Man 4 GB, you can collect these P-chips from enemies, which you can then spend at the shop on things such as E-Tanks and S-Tank, which refuels all your weapon energy along with your health, and even with several quality of life upgrades. This was the first time a shop appeared in the entire series, predating Mega Man 7 on the SNES by nearly two years. And dang it, it works great! But there's also some smaller tweaks that aid the gameplay and game flow. Along with regular E-Tanks, you can also find and purchase smaller, cheaper mini E-Tanks, which you can combine into one regular, actually usable E-Tank once you've collected four of them. Mega Man also has a charge shot in his slide ability, which were present in Mega Man 3 on Game Boy, sure, but just feel more refined here. The slide just feels a bit quicker, snappier, and more responsive, while the charge shot causes a small recoil to Mega Man every time it's fired, which you can actually use to aid with certain platforming challenges by shooting quickly turning in midair, using the recoil to propel you a little bit. Some of the special weapons have also been given secondary effects. In all the Rockman world games so far, the Robot Master weapons you get have been basically exactly the same as in their NES counterparts. However, that changes here. For example, Ringman's Ring Boomerang can be used to grab faraway items, and Toad Man's Rain Flush can be used to put out fires in areas such as the Napalm Man stage. Though some gimmicks return from the NES games, so much more is done with them in these stages. In Mega Man 5 on NES, there are sections where you had to run from these insta-kill drills in Napalm Man stage, for example. But here, you can actually ride on top of them, and then you have to use them to navigate certain platforming segments. There's also a little bit of emphasis on exploration here. Stages often contain multiple paths or secret areas, which is good as you're also seeking out eight letter capsules throughout this game. 
These are introduced in the first half of Mega Man 4 GB. We're collecting the letters of the word BEAT to unlock Mega Man's bird buddy BEAT as an unlockable weapon. However, in the second half, you need to collect the four Wily letters to access the final fortress. Granted, most of these are pretty easy to find, but even if a letter is missed and you have to backtrack, the stages are fun and varied enough for this to never feel like a pain. The cherry on top, though, is that final Dr. Wily Fortress. Before we go on to that, though, let's go over the plot. A few months after the events of MM3GB, scientists from around the world have gathered in a city that's basically Tokyo for the World Robot Expo. This exposition also features Mega Man's creator, Dr. Light. Suddenly, during the exposition, Dr. Wily appears in his flying saucer, announcing that he's going to be using some fancy radio wave trickery to take control of all the robots on display. Thankfully, Dr. Light manages to catch the quickest express flight home, boots up Mega Man, and sends him off to kick Dr. Wily's ass. It's a pretty simple Dr. Wily is evil stop and plot, but what makes it shine here is the presentation. MM4GB even has a proper, nicely done intro sequence. Between impressive sprite work and a solemnly epic backing track, it's a really effective introduction that sets the tone for the game. And it's actually just one of several well done cutscenes throughout. For example, take a look at the scene that plays before the Halfway Fortress. I know, it's a Game Boy cutscene, but the tension in the build up here, thanks in part to the great soundtrack, really helps make this title feel like a grand adventure. And yeah, the whole thing can be beaten in around an hour, which admittedly is longer than the previous games, but around on par lengthwise with most of the later mainline classic games. But it still feels like such an epic quest. This all culminates at the end of the game, with Dr. Wily escaping to a big, scary, skull-themed space station where Mega Man pursues him via a space-converted rush jet. And this fortress is easily one of the best in the series. Though it has numerous bosses and even a proper traditional boss rush in it, it's all laid out like one big continuous stage instead of multiple smaller stages. And it also has several checkpoints as well, meaning that a game over won't send you all the way back if you get one. Really, it feels like an actual epic trek through a massive base, a feel that most Mega Man fortresses never achieve, even in the mainline games. This all ends with a battle against Dr. Wily, where he takes you on in a giant mech. And on first sight, okay, yeah, I think it looks like a ripoff of the Sonic 3 and Knuckles final boss too. Wily even tries to crush you with his giant robot hands in the first form. But that's not really an apt comparison. After all, MM4GB came out in 1993, around a year or so before Sonic the Hedgehog 3. Like, damn, this is such a cool final boss. There's even a proper cutscene beforehand, showing Mega Man being legitimately bewildered by the size of that thing. There is the scale of the fight, with a difficulty that isn't intense but certainly respectable. And also, oh goodness, there's that music. Like in the previous Rockman World games, most of the tunes here are remixes from the NES Mega Man games. But dang it, the original music, what little of it there is, and Mega Man 4 GB is some of the best in the series. I'd even say that the Wily Boss theme here is my absolute favorite piece of boss music in the entire series. It's intense and pumping and oddly western in sound, but I'm so here for it. Especially since the main motif from this theme actually appears in several other tracks throughout the game as well. My biggest gripe with this game, then, is the ending. The other Game Boy games featured Dr. Wily getting away at the end, sure, but the plots there were mostly confined to manuals, or were in the lackluster MM2GB, so I just didn't care. But here, the admittedly simple plot is presented in a compelling way, making it actually a bit frustrating when Dr. Wily just yoinks himself away with a grapple hook at the end. The game even makes a point of giving Belayed a tragic end, with him sacrificing himself to protect Mega Man from the exploding Wily space station, but that ends up not mattering as well, since he just comes back in later games ready to duke it out with Mega Man once again. What I'm saying is, Mega Man 4 on Game Boy is a fantastic game. It's a load of fun, and there's a reason why it's one of my favorite games in the series, and it just gripped me so hard as a kid. It's one I'd also consider both a great starting point for new Mega Man fans, and also a great title to check out if you're a longtime fan of the series, wanting something to play that's a bit more Game Boy in aesthetic.
But also, while it's definitely the Game Boy Mega Man game I'm most nostalgic for, speaking as a critic, Mega Man 5 on Game Boy is just better. Before we go on, who watched Sailor Moon back in the day? I know I was way into it. Hell, I'm still way into it. I don't know what it is about having a squad of anime girls named after the planets that's so compelling, even with a kind of repetitive Monster of the Week style plot. It just is. And clearly those at Capcom and Minakuchi Engineering thought so too, because Mega Man 5 on the Game Boy would feature an entire group of planet named androids called the Star Droids. Look, I'm not saying this was absolutely influenced by Sailor Moon, but what I am saying is that Sailor Moon came out in 1992 and got huge shortly afterwards. And then Rockman World 5 here, which came out in 1994, just so happened to also have some similar theming. Anyways, Mega Man 5 GB is also one of two highly expensive games that we're covering today, routinely selling for over $200 USD online for a loose copy. That's why I don't actually own an American copy of this game. When I want to play Mega Man 5 GB, I either play my Japanese copy of Rockman World 5, which cost me only around 20 bucks a few years back, or the downloadable version that I got from the Nintendo 3DS eShop. This one is such a unique experience overall. The presentation may be similar to GB Mega Man 4, with it reusing things such as the shop system, but goodness, does it change things up mechanically. Gone are bosses and stage themes from the NES games, and N is an adventure that spans across the entire solar system. At the start of this game, a large chunk of time has passed since Dr. Wily's last attempt at world domination in Mega Man 4 GB, and the world seems to be at peace. Mega Man and his robotic sister Roll are going on a walk one day when they are encountered by a mysterious robot named Terra. Unfortunately for them, Terra is evil, and he seems hell-bent on enslaving not just Mega Man, but the rest of man and robot kind as well. Also, when Mega Man tries to attack him, his shots are merely deflected by Terra's armor, who quickly knocks him out. The unconscious Mega Man is worked back to Dr. Light's lab just in the nick of time by roll. Once there, Dr. Light upgrades him with a new weapon called the Mega Arm. This is a more powerful version of the standard pea shooter you had in previous games, which by the way was called the Mega Buster, that has a shot that comes back to you, kind of like a boomerang. Think of it like a more powerful, versatile version of the ring boomerang weapon from MM4GB, with the item grabbing ability even returning as well, albeit as an upgrade that you have to buy from the shop. Mega Man is also given a new animal companion to accompany him and Rush, with this being the feline robot Tango. I really love this little green cat. They spin all around like Sonic the Hedgehog when you call them out, and they can absolutely wreck a lot of enemies like nothing else. The adventure proceeds with Mega Man fighting the first four star droids, with these being Mercury, Venus, Mars, and Neptune. This is then followed by an interlude stage, where instead of fighting Terra as you initially think you might, you instead fight Dark Moon, who is a rather fun twist on that dang annoying Yellow Devil boss from the original Mega Man. From there, you get to fight the star droids of the outer solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Pluto. There's also collectible gems scattered throughout these later four stages, though those aren't required to beat the game. Instead, collecting all four gems will half the amount of energy the weapons you get from all the star droids take, which I think is pretty rad. Also, we gotta talk about how amazing these special weapons are. Saturn allows you to create a literal black hole. Jupiter gives you a short range yet super powerful electric zapper, and Mercury's weapon, the Grab Buster, allows you to sap energy from enemies like some sort of robotic vampire. There's also Pluto's weapon, the Brake Dash, which along with being great at close range, also feels like a classic Mega Man precursor to Mega Man X's Dash, which at the very least could be a very neat little continuity nod. Of all the weapons and abilities here, there's only one that I don't like. This is Uranus's Deep Digger, which along with having an absolutely nasty sounding name, ugh, can only be used to pick up specific blocks, just like Gutsman's weapon in Mega Man 1. Probably my favorite weapon here is the Spark Chaser, the weapon of Terra himself. After defeating the last of the Star Droids, Mega Man sets off in his rushed spaceship through an actual shoot-em-up style level, which I really didn't care for. 
Sure, a lot of the stages so far had gimmicks, with these ranging from gravity puzzles to landmine traps to even giant Egyptian-themed mini-bosses, but my god, these lasers in this stage pack a punch and are a pain to dodge, too! Thankfully, this is the only off-putting difficulty spike here, and it's not even a platforming stage. Also, the boss of that shooter stage does a really cool sprite scaling-esque effect really well when you first encounter it. And yes, you're fighting a literal skull laser on the front of a Death Star ripoff. Which again, really reminds me of Sonic 3. Though, as much as I want to be able to pull the Mega Man Did It First card again, the Wily Star was actually predated by the Sonic series Death Egg, which first appeared in Sonic 2 in 1992. Once in the Wily Star, you have to go through a whole gauntlet of bosses again. First off is the fight against Terra himself, which is pretty intense. Then, there's a fight against every single Mega Man killer from the previous games, plus Quint. And yeah, Quint isn't technically a Mega Man killer, though I don't think this was actually confirmed until Mega Man 10. Even then, that may have just been justification for giving Anchor Punk and Belay DLC stages, but not Quint. And can I really blame them for that, seeing how lackluster GB Mega Man 2 was? Also, Terra isn't a Mega Man killer either. Dr. Wily didn't even make the Star Droids. I think this was gone to more in depth than the Archie Mega Man comics, may they rest in peace, but long story short, the Star Droids are a bunch of robots created by an ancient alien civilization that was hell bent on galactic conquest. Dr. Wily found and awoke the Star Droids while doing his regularly scheduled evil scheming before the events of MM5 GB. Then, he tried to reprogram them to work for him. However, while Terra initially seems to be the biggest and baddest of them all, and indeed, he is listed as Star Droid number one, the most powerful of the Star Droids is actually the crazy powerful Sunstar. And for context on just how powerful this guy is, he is literally referred to as Sun God in the Japanese version. Sunstar isn't just another robot to defeat either. AI-wise, he's on par with something like the Reploids from the Mega Man X series, able to think and make his own choices. Indeed, after being released by Dr. Wily, he outright turns on the Mad Doctor and attacks him, something that goes against the rules of robotics. In my personal headcanon, I like to think that it is these events that led Dr. Wily to eventually create Zero, who would be prominently featured throughout the Mega Man X and Zero series, who can also think and make his own choices like this. But I won't go into that here, as this vid is long enough as is. Sunstar may have been able to defeat Dr. Wily, but he wants to destroy humanity too. So it's up to you as Mega Man to fight him in an epic battle in space. Make sure you have some E-Tanks on hand and your Spark Chaser handy, especially as that thing deals some decent damage to him. Also, it tries to hone in on enemies, which is pretty nice too. It's not the most difficult fight in the series, but thanks to some great build-up from the preceding cutscenes and epic fight music, it's definitely a memorable battle. It looks especially good if played via the Super Game Boy for the SNES, since Rockman World 5 here is the only one of these games to have a dedicated Super Game Boy Color palette programmed into it. But whether played in color or not, goodness, what a memorable game. It's not perfect, sure. Like all the other games covered today, it feels a little slower than its NES counterparts. Even on the Super Game Boy, there's not as much color as in a mainline entry, and though I like the fact that we once again have proper cutscenes, it feels like the ones here are a lot more text-heavy than the ones in the previous game. That's not a major gripe at all, I'm just a fan of storytelling that doesn't rely so heavily on a lot of dialogue. The soundtrack here, for lack of a better term, is stellar. It's among one of the best in the series, and combine that with a solid presentation, some of the tightest platforming on the Game Boy, and it's easy to see why this game is so sought after today. Even more so than the incredible MM4GB, you absolutely need to play this one any way you can if you're a fan of Mega Man or just platforming in general. It's just so damn good. And I'm sure it has you hyped up to see what's next too. After all, the next Mega Man game for the Game Boy would be set 100 years in the future, would be based off of the more fast-paced Mega Man X series, and it'd be made by Mega Man IP owner Capcom themselves to boot. So, does it live up to the hype? Well, uh, it's complicated. <laughs> This is Mega Man Extreme, spelled without an E in Extreme. Similar to Sonic Extreme in that respect, except this one actually got released. 
And my god, that name just reeks of 90s. Anyways, as mentioned earlier, besides the Game Boy Classic games, Minakuchi Engineering would work on two other Mega Man titles. One of these would be Mega Man The Wily Wars for the Sega Genesis, which was a pretty solid remake compilation of Mega Man 1, 2, and 3 from the NES for Sega's 16-bit blast processing powerhouse. It even included a pretty sweet bonus game called Wily Tower, which featured exclusive stages and bosses and even allowed you to mix and match weapons from those first three titles. The second of these games, though, would be 1995's Mega Man X3. Minakuchi, after years of work on the Game Boy, would finally be allowed to make a mainline Mega Man game, albeit for the X series instead of the Classic series. And X3 was pretty dang good! Released a year after GB Mega Man 5 for the SNES, PS1, and Saturn, this game would be rather polarizing to say the least. What differentiates the X series from the classic games is that it has a darker tone and is much more fast paced and more focused on collectibles. Indeed, X3 had the standard heart tanks, which expand your life bar, sub tanks, which are refillable E tanks, and even permanent armor upgrades that up your abilities, like in all the other X games. But some would argue that X3 pushed it a bit too far, also including a system of multiple unlockable ride armors and no less than three optional bosses that could affect how the end game played out. There is also an optional set of pink armor capsules and the ability to play as Mega Man X's long hair breast lighted buddy, Zero. Though this was only available on stages and not against bosses, and if Zero died once, and I mean like died at all, he was out of commission for the rest of the game. An odd choice for a title I honestly didn't like as a kid. Recently though, I replayed X3 over on the Jamie Play Stuff Twitch channel, and I don't know what clicked this time, but I actually really enjoyed X3. Maybe it's the stage design, maybe it's the fact I played the PS1 version instead of the SNES version, and I was absolutely vibing with that 90s sounding Redbook Audio OST. Maybe it's even just because our tastes and interests change over time as we get older, and that's okay. Or maybe it's just because Minakuchi did a dang good job. Despite the game's quirks, it's fast and fun all the way through. For the most part. I can definitely see why this is such a polarizing title. And perhaps that's why this game didn't bode well for Minakuchi, since it was the last title that they ever developed, with them quietly closing their doors around the turn of the millennium. Maybe that's why Capcom handled Mega Man Extreme internally, as it was released on the Game Boy Color in 2000. And don't get me wrong, it's not a bad game, but clearly they didn't take many notes from Minakuchi's later works. Set over a hundred years after the classic Mega Man series, the X series involves Mega Man's successor, Mega Man X, who fights against a bunch of evil Reploid robots called Mavericks as part of a group called the Maverick Hunters. The big bad is almost always the big green ash chin Sigma, who steals candy from toddlers and likes to kick puppies when he's not practicing his monologues. At the start of Mega Man Extreme 1, X is at the Maverick Hunter base when their base's mother computer suddenly goes haywire. It's apparently been hacked by an unknown source, and its main technician, Mitty, lets us know that the only way to stop it is for X to plug himself into the magical 90s-tastic world of the internet or whatever, and go through digitized versions of past battles. Which is to say, it's an excuse to rehash stages and bosses for Mega Man X1 and X2 on the SNES. It ultimately ends up that the hacking was the result of Mitty's twin robot brother, Techno, who is possessed by Sigma or something. Also, Techno is being assisted by two mooks named Gimo and Zane, who can be fought in optional battles throughout the game. The game ends with Techno dying, Midi having a mental breakdown over it, and then things just kind of ending after that, with X wondering how long Reploids must continue to fight one another or something like that. I don't know, he does that at the end of every game. But that's it! I summarized the entire plot of Extreme in two paragraphs of script. So why does this game have unskippable, dialogue-filled cutscenes? Oh god, there, there, there's so much dialogue! Why though? This game might as well be called Rockman World X with how it's all laid out. Now, don't get me wrong, Mega Man Extreme looks and sounds great. It even has a proper save system too. No more clunky passwords. Oh, and heart tanks and sub tanks are back, along with armor capsules. And X has always moves available from the SNES games. 
The only annoyance is that to use his dash ability, you either gotta press down and jump at the same time or double tap forward. This makes dash jumping, a maneuver I use the hell out of in most X games, trickier than I'm used to. But also I'm not sure how else would be done here since the GBC only has two action buttons, a D-pad, and a start and select button. Mega Man Extreme is also split into two campaigns, well technically three. In the first campaign you fight Chill Penguin, Spark Mandrel, and Storm Eagle from Mega Man X1 and Flame Stag from Mega Man X2 before going through a short Final Fortress. In the second campaign, which you unlock after beating the first, you go up against Armored Armadillo from X1 and Magna Centipede, Wheel Gator, and Morph Moth from X2. Their stages are all mostly the same as on the SNES, really feeling less original than the Rockman World games and more like nearly straight ports of their console counterparts. The really weird thing is that these two campaigns are labeled as normal and hard mode. And why? There's not really any difficulty change between the two. They both begin with the same exact intro stage, which itself is ripped out of Mega Man X1. The fortress stages are also pretty similar too, save some boss differences. Really, they are two completely different campaigns that hardly differ in difficulty. I wish they just removed the long, boring cutscenes and smashed these two campaigns together to make one normal length Mega Man adventure. Which they actually did though! Beating the hard mode campaign unlocks extreme mode, which has all eight stages playable as one campaign, no cutscenes, and some minor tweaks to the fortress stages so that the boss rush accommodates this. And that's it. And honestly, this should have been the entire game! If it weren't for the odd 90s tastic shoehorned in cyberplot, this game really wouldn't have much identity of its own. And as is, it barely does anyways. And sure, in the year 2000, this would have been a fine way to experience Mega Man X action on the go. In the modern day, nah, there's really no reason to play this. The Nintendo Switch has the X Legacy Collection on it. Just play X1 and 2 off of that. Mega Man Xtreme is not a bad game, but it just fills a niche that doesn't need filling anymore. So, even if you're a diehard Mega Man X fan, you're fine passing on this one. <sighs> okay, Jamie. Just one more Game Boy game left. Let's just hope this series ends on a high note. Damn it, it didn't end on a high note. It's odd. Extreme 2 technically has the most on offer out of all these games. It features two different playable characters, with those being X and Zero. It has a seemingly more involved plot, taking place before the events of Mega Man X4 and featuring Zero's love interest, Iris. Hell, it even has a pretty neat plot concept, involving a shady island run by some robotic LARPers who are sending Reploid souls to the Shadow Realm. But I just have so little to say about this one. Honestly, though I remember really enjoying it as a kid, I don't remember a lot of exact details, and I think I liked this one way less than the first Extreme game as an adult. It's the same setup as in the first game, except instead of the weird difficulty campaign shenanigans, this game is set up into an X mission and a Zero mission. Along with the stages changing between these two campaigns, the character you play as also changes. It's on the name. Also, there's a bit more to these stages too, since some actual liberties were taken with some of the stage designs to make them different from their SNES counterparts. Hell, in the intro stage, the path you take is different depending on if you're playing as X or Zero. Also, there's a shop here again, which is nice to see. Some of the shop upgrades really help with the fortress stages too, especially as one of the few original bosses here is, to say the least, an annoying massive sack of crap who's really hard to damage. But the meat and potatoes here is pretty similar to the first extreme game. X's campaign features Launch Octopus and Flame Mammoth from X1 and Neon Tiger and Volt Catfish from X3. Meanwhile, Zero's campaign features Wire Sponge and Overdrive Ostrich from X2 and Blast Hornet and Tunnel Rhino from X3. Then, like before, there is an extreme mode that you unlock after being the main campaigns that combines X and Zero stages together and also allows you to switch between X and Zero while playing through the campaign, a la Mega Man X5 and beyond which should be really good in concept. And you know, 
I was initially pretty stoked to play as Zero here. Now though, I really wish I could have just avoided playing as him altogether. X is still fine to play as though, and the foot parts here even makes dashing a bit more comfortable. But Zero, my favorite dang character to play as an X4 and X6, is just miserable to control here. He's a close range fighter, which is fine, that's how Zero's always been, but I swear his Z Saber seems pathetic compared to in the PS1 games or the later Zero titles. It doesn't help either that you have to get right up close to hit enemies, and it never feels like you get any breathing room. It feels like you have to be right on top of an enemy as Zero to even deal damage. Again, it's not all bad. X is still fun to control, and all the bosses from the first game return as part of a boss attack mode. But Extreme 2, despite trying to set itself apart from the games it rips assets from, it's just not fun to play. Like, it's not terrible. I mean, some of the level designs are pretty terrible. But no, no. Mega Man X6, and especially X7, are way worse than this. But like with Extreme 1, and really especially so here, why would you play this nowadays when there's a perfectly fine Mega Man X collection available on the Switch? That said, if what you're seeing here does make you want to give this or Extreme 1 a shot, both of them did get re-releases on the Nintendo 3DS eShop. So, if you're morbidly curious, sure, go check them out there. Besides, it is kind of cool that these really obscure Mega Man games got re-released. It's more than that can be said for the Mega Man Game Gear game. $170, American dollars, bucks, smackers, freedom funds. According to PriceCharting.com, that's how much US Gold's Mega Man for the Sega Game Gear will cost you. Originally released in 1995, this would be the only Mega Man game for Sega's full color handheld brick. And my goodness, I'm someone who had to debate whether or not they should drop $15 on Sonic Triple Trouble a game that they love. Whether Mega Man GG is good or bad, $170 is too rich for my blood. Which is why I also gotta shout out my buddy G to the next level for being a lucky enough dude to actually own this thing. By the way, on the topic of shouts as well, I really gotta give it up to my friend Trey, who allowed me to commission him to edit this behemoth of a video. Seriously dude, this just would have not been possible without you. But back on the topic of Mega Man GG, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is that this game ain't actually half bad. The bad news is that it's the most rehashy game yet. Featuring only 7 stages total, all of them are ripped nearly verbatim from Mega Man's 2, 4, and 5 on the NES. And being on the Game Gear, they look and sound nearly identical too, though there are a few quirks here. First off, due to being mostly straight level conversions, there's some screen crunch issues here mean that some really easily seeable obstacles from the NES games become leaps of faith in this one. Second off, there are no continues, meaning that if you game over, it's back to the title screen. And finally, none of the weapons have their cool names in the original games here. Like, Stone Man's weapon is just Stone Weapon, and Bright Man's weapon is just Bright Weapon, and it's all kind of really lame. The game seems like it's four main levels and then a fortress, except all three fortress stages are also just regular boss stages that are ripped from the NES games. The four initial stages are Bright Man from Mega Man 4 and Stone Man, Napalm Man, and Star Man from Mega Man 5. Then the fortress consists of Wave Man from Mega Man 5, then Toad Man from Mega Man 4, and then a final Wily stage that features Quick Man stage from Mega Man 2. Except, the insta-kill laser beams are no longer insta-kill, and instead of fighting Quick Man at the end, you fight Dr. Wily in his flying saucer capsule. And that's it! You get some MS Paint looking fireworks and a congrats screen because you did it! You just beat Mega Man for the Game Gear. Do you feel accomplished? Back in the 90s, because of how accurate of a conversion these stages are, this game could absolutely have been a source of bragging rights on the playground. You know, an easy thing to taunt your Game Boy owning friends with before they all left you because nobody likes a fanboy. Once again, this is a game that's not bad, just really, really rehashy. 
In fact, this is the most rehashy of them all. It's literally Mega Man 4 and 5 smashed together with a hint of screen crunch and Mega Man 2 thrown in for good measure. And that's it. You don't need to play it, and I can absolutely see why it was never re-released. And trust me, you certainly don't need to spend $170 to own a copy of it. But with that, that's it for this look at the Mega Man games on the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Gear. Eight games, 33 pages of script, and five years of stuff we play. Yeah, I can't believe my original video on these games is five years old now. I didn't know what to do exactly for the channel's anniversary for a while. Like, five years is a long time to do anything. But what I do know is that my thoughts on these titles has changed a bit since that video back in 2016, as have my abilities to actually present, produce, and edit, or in this case, hire someone to edit, a video. I'm definitely going to leave that old video up, but I do think this current vid does these games more justice. Sure, they mostly aren't incredible. Honestly, the only two must-plays, in my opinion, are Game Boy, Mega Man 4, and 5. But they're all still mostly games that I played the hell out of as a kid, and I'm really glad I got to share them with you. Whether they're good, bad, original, or rehashy, in their own ways, I feel like these are still games that are at the very least worth remembering. And it's kind of nice to see that with how much has changed, my original copies of these games are still here. Now I know this has been a long video, but I do have a couple of things I want to announce here. And I want this to both be in video form uh, and just out there in kind of a, a way that feels permanent, even though I know I have a perfectly fine community tab that I currently use for regular updates. Now first off, I know some may have seen this around socials and stuff, but I just want it out here now. I'm trans. I've already gone by Jamie for a good while now. I use she, her pronouns. And this is going to affect my channel branding. Well, well it's really not going to affect my channel branding, I should say. I've been using a kind of androgynous looking avatar and done collabs with other queer creators for a good while now. But I just want this out here as being trans is part of who I am. Second off though, I've been getting a lot of viewer questions lately, not just about me being trans, but also on me covering certain games or about how I got certain parts of my game collection or whatnot. And though my DMs on Twitter and Discord are always open, as is my Twitch stream chat, I do know there are some folks who prefer to have questions answered just on YouTube. So this video is going out on the 1st of May, 2021. Until the 15th of May, 2021, feel free to ask questions here or on Discord or on Twitter or even via the community tab. And 20 I like best will be featured in a game room slash film setup slash house tour I'll be releasing on the 1st of June, 2021. That said, any questions I don't choose that are DM'd to me, I'll try to respond to as well. But any that are vile or threatening will be removed because seriously, people, just be excellent to each other. Keanu Reeves said it, just do it. But yeah, feel free to ask about anything. Game collecting or videos I should do or about queer stuff or whatever. This, this part's off the cuff, can you tell? But really, anything goes as long as it's mostly PG-13, really. That said, I'm really glad to be doing a marathon of sorts after so long. Mega May has been something I've wanted to do my own spin on for, for years now, really. And I think y'all are really going to like the vids I have in the pipeline. Just know that, like with most vids I've been working on besides the house tour, they're going to be voiceover only, because I'm really vibing with that style as of late. Uh, if only because I've been watching a lot of Jay's reviews and Quickies Don't Cut It, and that's been kind of influencing me. Anyways, I've rambled on long enough. Stuff We Play is made possible in part by our Patreon patrons, YouTube channel members, and Jamie Plays, uh, Jamie Plays Stuff Twitch channel subs. Ooh, I'm stumbling over words. It's like my sixth take. Let me know what your favorite Game Boy games are in the comments below, too. And I don't mean what you think are the best, critically speaking, but the games you find yourself coming back to time and time again. Your favorites. And while you're at that, don't forget to subscribe to Stuff We Play for more great content like this. So on that note, thank you very much for watching, stay classy, and I'll see you next time. Ah. <sighs>